Good morning and welcome to CMC Markets on Friday the 17th of June and this quick look at the week ahead beginning the 20th of June. But before we get to that, I think it's important to obviously look back at the catalyst for this week's big market sell-off. Um, we saw a little bit of a decline late Friday as a consequence of a much hotter than expected 8.6% US CPI number. And there were reports out over the weekend, last weekend that is, that um, in the lead up to Wednesday's Fed meeting, there had been some anonymous briefing, briefings to buy beneficials to friendly journalists about the prospect that rather than doing 50 basis points, this week, as had been widely expected and widely briefed by Fed officials and Powell, Jay Powell in particular, that the Fed was looking to potentially do 75 basis points um, on Wednesday. And obviously that is, that is essentially what turned out to be the case. However, the way that it was done obviously raised more questions than answers. Well, you know, the bigger question is, what does one CPI print tell you that um, other indicators don't? And certainly a lot of the other indicators that we've seen from the US economy have shown that there is an economic slowdown um, this week, earlier this week, after obviously the Fed meeting. Uh, we saw housing starts and building permits fall quite sharply. I think one of the concerns that Fed officials had, I think, in undergoing this policy shift so late in the day during the blackout period was that inflation expectations on the Michigan consumer confidence numbers, which came in at a record low, were edging quite a bit higher. Um, but, you know, inflation expectations come and go and they tend to be fairly transitory in nature. Having said that, there's that T word again. Um, but nonetheless, to react on the basis of a single data point when the PPI numbers do appear to be showing some signs of softening um, and have been on the decline since the peaks that we saw in March. They, they fell back in April and they fell back again in May. Um, it would suggest that inflation pressures in the US economy are starting to plateau and that the Fed could have easily achieved its goal of signalling a significant tightening of monetary policy by doing 50 basis points, but putting 75 basis points back on the table for July after Powell took the prospect of it off the table in his previous press conference. So certainly communication on the part of the Federal Reserve was severely lacking this week and certainly i think conducting policy by way of leaking to journalists is not a good look um, there are certainly more ways that the, the federal reserve could have articulated its message rather than the way that they did um, that being said the damage is done the fed hiked by 75 basis points signaling a determination to get on top of public enemy number one which is high levels of inflation, and more importantly than that, um, to try and pare back long-term inflation expectations with a view to potentially starting to cut rates towards the end of 2023, beginning of 2024. Certainly, the Fed dot plots do appear to suggest that that's what the Fed expect to happen. Go hard and heavy now um, with a view to prompting a short, sharp shock, a recession um, by the end of this year, beginning of next, um, with a view to cutting rates later. The only problem with that scenario is that the US economy could already be in a technical recession. That's because in the first quarter, we saw an economic contraction. And given by the look of some of the recent data and the weak retail sales numbers that we saw this week for May, there is a case to answer that potentially Q2 could be as weak or not quite as weak, but certainly um, could be 
a minus number for Q2, which in essence would be a technical recession. So we could already be there. Um, that was followed up on Thursday, the Fed rate hike of 75 basis points, which had largely been priced in, but had already seen a significant sell off in the S&P 500 in the lead up to the decision before we got a late Friday bounce, uh, so Friday bounce, uh, late Wednesday bounce in the aftermath of the decision, followed by a complete meltdown on Thursday. So we've basically haven't been able to get back significantly above the 3810 area, which happened to be the previous lows. So that remains the key resistance level on the upside. So we're still making lower highs, we're still making lower lows. And while we're below 3840, the, the previous reaction highs that we saw on Wednesday, then for me, we still remain on course for a move towards three and a half thousand. I think one of the reasons that um, was responsible for the big sell off um, or exacerbated, I should say, the, the big sell off that we saw on Thursday was, surpri was the surprise decision by the Swiss National Bank to hike by 50 basis points. Um, that was a surprise. No one would really expected a, the, the, the hawkish pivot that we got. It was significant in that it came completely out of the blue. Um, and while I think the expectation had been that the, the SMB would signal that they would hike rates in July, there was never any prospect that they were going to pivot as hard as they did um, when they met on Thursday. But that's essentially what happened. And you can certainly see that reflected in the way dollar Swiss behaved yesterday. Um, and it's quite significant that we weren't able to break above parity uh, against the dollar. We posted a key day reversal on the daily chart the day before. Um, and then, of course, the big, big decline, um, a 3% decline in a single day. And obviously, we saw Euro Swiss come lower as well. So I think what's changed this week is that not only have central banks um, become an awful lot more serious about tackling CPI, they're going to be really aggressive going forward with respect to how they do it. They're going to target headline inflation to the exclusion of pretty much everything else. They, the the, the trade-off is higher unemployment. And if that's the trade-off they have to make, that's what they're going to do. So that, the upside to that is unemployment is at very historically low levels at the moment. So they've certainly got an awful lot of wriggle room to play with. The same can't be said for the Bank of Japan. The Bank of Japan has continued to remain on hold, continues to um, practice its uh, yield curve control. And on that basis, we've seen a bit of a pullback in the dollar yen. The one that, that I think the thing that gives me pause here with respect to dollar yen is we saw a we saw a similar bearish key day reversal. We've seen a break lower, but now we're heading back higher again. So the dynamic here is slightly different. But nonetheless, even though I think there's potential for dollar yen to potentially go back through 135 and head towards 137. The chartist in me is a little bit reluctant to potentially go aggressively long at these sorts of levels, unless or until we break above these two twin peaks here at 135.50. So certainly in terms of a cautious, you know, short position on dollar yen, I think um, you know that there may there may be some mileage in that with a fairly tight stop loss. But certainly in the context of that chart there, the pullback that we've seen on the back of this morning's decision um, does suggest that the Bank of Japan is no closer to looking to tighten monetary policy. Maybe next week's CPI numbers will do that. Um, and that's one of the key items that I've got on the agenda for next week. Japanese CPI for May, we've seen a 14% decline in the yen so far year to date and a central bank policy of neglect of the exchange rate um, as it tries to basically push headline inflation above that 2% level. And it currently is above 2%. Um, if you exclude food and energy, it's at 2.1.
it's likely to remain in that sort of level. But Corroda has said that he wants it to um, be maintained above that 2% target for a period of time. So I think it's unlikely that the Jet Bank of Japan is going to uh, tighten monetary policy, certainly in the short to medium term, until we get clearer evidence that CPI, headline CPI, is well above that 2% level. I think he could be I think he could be finding out the answer to that in fairly short order, given the big declines we've seen in the Japanese yen over the course of the past uh, few weeks. The big topic for this week, the Bank of England. The Bank of England once again basically failed to deliver, failed to deliver, flattered to deceive. Um, and yes, they did offer some fairly hawkish guidance, but once again, um, the 25 basis point rate hike at a time when inflation is expected to not only be higher at the end of this year than it is now, but also to be significantly higher um, at the end of this year. In fact, the Bank of England revised up their inflation forecasts from 10% to 11%, while at the same time saying that there would be they would be prepared to act forcefully to rein in higher than expected levels of inflation, which sounds a little bit oxymoronic, if you like, because they're talking about the need to rein in inflation. They're talking about the need to act forcefully to rein in higher levels of inflation. They then upgrade their inflation forecasts and then only raise by 25 basis points. Um, and yes, they did hold out the prospect of much more aggressive tightening between now and the end of this year. And the current base rate is 1.25%. Now, obviously, markets are pricing in much higher rates than that by the end of this year. In fact, markets are pricing in another 1.75% in rate hikes between now and the end of 2022. Well, there's another four meetings between now and the end of the year. The next meeting is August the 4th. That's when we get the latest set of economic projections and the economic forecasts. And maybe there's a case to answer that perhaps the Bank of England is going to hike rates more aggressively at its August meeting when it's in receipt of these new forecasts. But between now and the next Bank of England meeting, the, the Federal Reserve will be hiking by at least another 50 or 75 basis points. Given the fact the Bank of England is already 50 basis points behind the Federal Reserve and is likely to be at least another 100 points behind by the 4th of August, um, you could argue that they're falling even further behind. That being said, the promise of higher rates did prompt a big rebound in the pound on Thursday. But we saw a little bit of a rebound on Wednesday as well. And what's significant about that was that we managed to hold above that key support level that I highlighted and have been highlighting for several weeks now, around about um, the lows that we saw back in 2019, apart from obviously that level there. This 11950, 120 area is big, it's huge, it's massive. We weren't able to close below that. The reaction off that suggests that we could well see further sterling gains going forward. And we could see a little bit of a period of dollar weakness. Now, that bias will only remain while we stay above this key level here. But certainly, I think the Bank of England have probably done just about enough, perhaps, to put a floor under cable. But what they need to do now is they need to deliver. You know, And there's an awful lot of water that can flow under the bridge between now and the 4th of August. So... You know, it, it remains to be seen as to whether or not we're going to see a higher cable. But certainly on the charts, the daily charts, the prospects for now um, look fairly positive for a move off the lows back to these sorts of levels around about 126 and potentially higher. We're still very much in a downtrend on cable, but there is encouraging evidence perhaps that we, we could be starting to see a little bit of a bottom and perhaps Tuesday's CPI numbers um, for May could maybe feed into that more bullish narrative because the Bank of England has said that if it continues to see firmer levels of headline CPI that it will be much more inclined 
to hike rates more aggressively. Now, that's going to be a big move if it happens. If the Bank of England hikes by 50 basis points um, between now and the end of the year, um, it'll be the first time it will have ever hiked by more than 25 basis points since the MPC came into existence in 1997. The Bank of England have never hiked rates by more than 25 basis points. So 50 will be a big deal. The fact they didn't act this week is disappointing and I think a missed opportunity. I think they had the opportunity to get ahead of it, but nonetheless, we are where we are. We, I think they've just done just about enough, but you know, this, this particular comment on mine may well not last the next week or so. It, it will remain to be seen, but certainly expectations for May CPI are for an increase in the headline rate from 9% to 9.2%, with core prices set to remain in and around the 6% level. I'm going to pay particular attention to the PPI numbers because the PPI numbers still remain very, very high. And if they continue to move higher on an annualised basis, and in April they were at 18.6% on the input level, we're expecting another raise to 18 point, or another rise to 18.8. That would suggest that we've still got more room for inflation to move higher. RPI is at 11 point is 11.1 that's expected to rise to 11.4 so i just can't help the feeling that the bank of england didn't do enough and will probably need to make signal a lot more hawkish intent when it comes to trying to put a floor under what we're seeing is underlying sterling weakness which is exacerbating the inflationary impulse when it comes to food and energy prices and given the fact that obviously the pound is down over 10% against the dollar over the course of the last 12 months, which is making matters even worse. Euro sterling, we've seen quite a lot of volatility in that. We had an ECB um, emergency meeting this week where they announced the possibility of a new tool, um, a monetary policy tool to deal with fragmentation in Eurozone bond markets. I'm still very skeptical about how that is likely to work. Certainly the markets liked what they thought would be a game changer, but that lasted all of about 24 hours. But it did have the effect of basically knocking out all those euro sterling short positions above 86, went as high as 87.40 before falling back. But what's different here is that we are now very much in an uptrend for euro sterling. And until or unless we break a below this trend line here, there is perhaps um, a chance that we could well head back towards those peaks that we saw um, earlier this week. Really want to see a significant break below 85 and a series of lows around about 84.80 to signal that we're going to fall back into the range that we've been in over the course of the last few months. And as we can see that from here, you know, Euro sterling. This is the first, I think, significant volatility that we've seen in Euro sterling over the course of the past few months. Um, but it's still very much chop, and I think it still very much um, is range bound when it comes to um, where it's likely to go to next. I don't foresee any significant sterling weakness when it comes to movement in Euro sterling. So, as I say, certainly on, in terms of the data, um, there's really not an awful lot to look forward to next week. Let's look at euro dollar. Again, that 103.40 level continues to look fairly well supported. Perhaps there's a perception that maybe the dollar has topped out. Um, certainly, I think if you look at the way dollar Swiss behaved, um, there is a there is a prospect that maybe the ECB, sorry, the Swiss National Bank could potentially do further rate hikes. Certainly, I think the sell-off that we saw in the NASDAQ and the S&P was prompted by concerns that the Swiss National Bank might look to reduce its holdings of US tech stocks, of which it owns quite a significant portfolio. Um, it owns big stakes in Apple, Tesla, Microsoft, Amazon, Alphabet, um, and that could well be behind why we've seen the big sell-off this week in the NASDAQ, we are now at 18-month uh, lows there. 
What's significant about the sell-off that we've seen this week from the NASDAQ is that now that we've broken below the 50% retracement level of this entire up move from the 2020 lows, we haven't been back above it. And I think there's a decent chance that we're going to see further losses in the NASDAQ. 10,500 is my next target for that. 3,500 is my next target for the S&P. I don't think the losses that we've seen um, this week are the end of the story. I think there's more losses to come. It remains very much a sell the rally type of market. And um, we've gone to, I think the, the sentiment has shifted from fear of missing out to fear of holding on, FOMO to FOHO. Yes, there's a new acronym doing the rounds. We are now looking at potentially fear of holding on. So we haven't seen capitulation yet when it comes to the US tech sector. I think certainly a retest or a test of 10,500 on the NASDAQ is likely over the course of the next few days and weeks and similar declines in terms of the S&P 500. Certainly there's no evidence at the moment that a base is in. Um, and we certainly, sh we certainly need to be cognizant of the risk of further declines. What I've also seen this week is the FTSE 100 fall back below the lows that we saw in May. Found a little bit of support, 7,000. We're still above the lows of earlier this month. Significant that 7,000 level has held. It also held back there in November last year. Obviously, we saw a little bit of a spike below there. We didn't stay down there for long. So perhaps we've seen a little bit of a short-term base in the FTSE 100 as well. There certainly does appear to be a significant area of support in and around 6980, 7000. So perhaps we're probably just seeing a little bit of a widening of the ranges when it comes to the FTSE. The German DAX also managed to hold above the lows um, of earlier this year. But certainly I think there is, a, there is this feeling that maybe European markets are more vulnerable. Um, certainly the, there's, there's risks of an earnings slowdown. I don't think the ECB is going to be anywhere near as aggressive when it comes to hiking rates as the Federal Reserve is likely to be, or potentially um, the Bank of England. But nonetheless, we are still on course for the ECB to hike rates in July. I think the big game changer will be whether or not um, we see any progress on a fragmentation tool. Um, and we'll know more about that by the time the July meeting comes around. Another theme this week, which has helped drive the equity market sell-off, has been the weakness in Bitcoin. And I really wanted to talk about this this week simply because of this support level here at around about 19,650, 19,700. Why is that important? It's important because it was the previous peaks and the previous resistance that marked the move up in December 2020 to the record highs that we saw um, back around 60,000 here. And another go at 60, 70,000, we've fallen all the way back. So that really, this 19,000, it was the peaks back in 2017. It was the peaks for a while back in 2020. Once we broke above that, um, we moved significantly higher. And I think if we're able to consolidate a move below that 19,600 area, 19,700, that, that, that area between 9,500 and 20,000, then you could see further margin calls. Companies like MicroStrategy, who have very big Bitcoin holdings, could well have to sell out of those positions, exacerbating a move towards 10,000. So if we are, you know, if we do see a significant break lower in Bitcoin, that could spill over into a broader um, asset market, equity market sell-off going forward um, as people um, try to free up cash to meet margin calls going forward. Um, Brent crude prices, once again, no real sort of clues on that. 
still remain a little bit toppy around about 125, 126. It's significant that equity markets hit their lows back in March when crude oil prices hit those highs back in 140. We've retested the 125 area, but we haven't as yet retested the lows um, in equity markets. I think further moves higher in oil prices could constrain, obviously, equity markets going forward if they continue to move higher. Um, certainly, I think it's going to make central banks much more um, determined to push rates up if commodity prices continue to remain at their currently elevated levels. What else am I looking at this week aside from CPI from the UK and Japan? Not much. We've got flash PMIs from France, Germany and the UK. But to, to be fair, I mean, they're, they're, they're largely meaningless because they, they certainly don't signal that any of the respective economies in France, Germany or the UK are experiencing economic difficulties and they undoubtedly are. They're still in the mid 50s and they don't really give a, a significant indication of how well or otherwise the respective economies are doing. We do have US bank stress test results um, and these were basically laid out by the Federal Reserve earlier this year and I think they're important and I think they're important for the following reasons. At a time when prices are surging, consumer confidence is plunging, the results of these stress tests could not be timelier. Fortunately, with the unemployment rate at a multi-year low of 3.5%, this week's results shouldn't offer too much in the way of concerns over the resilience of the US banking sector. I think we know that it's in much better shape than it has been for quite some time. But certainly the direction of travel for bank shares, in this case, we're looking at JP Morgan Chase, um, and obviously earnings season will be starting within the next month or so. And obviously US bank earnings will be front and center of that. Um, these but these, stress, these, these bank stress tests are basically done on the 34 biggest US banks and we'll see the results of a severe global recession with heightened stress in commercial real estate and corporate debt markets. Now this year's tests parameters include a 5.75% rise in US unemployment to over 10% over the next two years. The test also models a 40% decline in commercial real estate values, widening corporate bond spreads and a sharp rise in market volatility. So um, furthermore, banks with large trading operations will be tested against the collapse of one of their largest counterparties. So they're going to be quite significant. I think an awful lot of the US banks are likely to pass them. Certainly the, the systemically important ones will be. But nonetheless, I think they're, that that there'll certainly be a good yardstick for, or a good, a good, good setting up point for earnings season, which starts in a few weeks' time. On the earnings front, we've got Associated British Foods, owner of Primark. Um, certainly, I think if times are tough, you would expect a company like Associated British Foods, which has a fairly diverse um, operating model, to be doing much better, but it's very much in a downtrend. There is, I think, some evidence that we could be forming a little bit of a base. Um, the share price is at two year lows. It's slid to a nine year low, briefly below the March 2020 lows in April here, um, has since recovered. But the thing with ABF is it also has a food, sugar and agriculture business. So obviously costs there are going up, costs in its supply chains are going up. But as a budget retailer, and particularly in, in the context of Primark, its business has rebounded quite significantly. And in April, the company reported a 25% rise in first half group revenue of £7.9 billion. Pounds. So these Q3 numbers, um, are likely to be important in the context of the wider retail story, the wider consumer discretionary story. Now, earlier this week, fast fashion retailers, ASOS and Boohoo, Boohoo, <laughs> Boohoo, 
um, got absolutely pummeled on the back of their latest numbers. And that suggests that, you know, fast fashion is starting to fall out of fashion, uh, pun intended. Um, so it's really a question of budget retailers should do well. You know, have the shares fallen far, far enough to be considered a bargain? Um, you know, and I think that's a big question that um, investors need to ask themselves. In Europe, the bounce back has been much more muted. Consumer footfall is still weak in Europe. The US is trading well. Food division has seen a sharp rise in input costs, which has eroded its operating margins. But nonetheless, you know, the company is doing fairly decent. You know, it's doing fairly well, economic conditions notwithstanding, and did announce an interim dividend of 13.8p per share, which is due to be paid on the 8th of July. So, you know, the bigger question is, is this, are we are we near the bottom or have we got further to go? And at the moment, you know, I think an awful lot will depend on this week's Q3 trading update and more importantly, how um, Primark Management Associated British Foods Management see the outlook. Another key bellwether of how well the economy is doing is logistics, parcels and logistics and FedEx. Um, seen a very challenging year. Um, certainly there's big resistance at $240. We saw a big spike in the share price earlier this week when FedEx announced they'd be increasing the dividend to $1.15 a share, as well as announcing a significant board, board shakeup. Um, Four-year profits guidance was kept unchanged in Q3. They've been, they, they spent most of the last nine months adjusting it down, adjusting it up, adjusting it down, adjusting it up. Disruptions caused by the Omicron variant caused some um, disruption, staff shortages in Q3. This week's Q4 numbers um, are likely to see the effect of FedEx raising its fuel surcharge fees across all its shipping services from the 4th of April. The cost of labour saw an increase of $350 million in Q3. The fact they're increasing the dividend suggests that this week's Q4 and four year numbers should meet or beat expectations with Q4 profits expected to come in at $6.87 a share. So certainly be a decent indicator of how well the US economy is doing, um, given the fact that obviously we saw a little bit of weakness in May retail sales and figures released earlier this week. Also got Carnival, cruise line sector, no respite there. That looks pretty ugly. Um, Carnival are reporting first half numbers. Higher fuel prices are likely to impact them. Obviously, disruption to flights and what have you. Um, it's causing its fair share amounts of problems. Its Q2 numbers this week are still expected to see the company make a loss. But bookings have started to recover strongly, and hopefully the second half of this year will be a vast improvement on the first half of this year. So those carnival numbers come out on the 24th of June. So um, that's pretty that's pretty much it for this week. As I say, this, we've had quite a lot to get through. It's been a busy week. It still feels very much like a case of sell the rally type of market. Um, the direction of travel for central banks is very much towards higher rates. That's likely to be a case of, um, you know, the type of dictate the type of recession that we're likely to um, experience over the course of the next 12 months and make no bones about it. I think recession is never inevitable. It's really a matter of degree. And I think as a consequence of that, market volatility will reflect that. So that's very much it for this week. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for listening. Have a great weekend. Speak to you all same time, same place next week. Thank you.